we can now come back to what we covered at the beginning of this section in terms of what we call the initial mass function. This is a power law that essentially telling you the relative number of stars that are form as a function of mass at the moment of creation of stars. And also that if you want to look at the amount or the mass in stars per mass, you can actually multiply by mass and then you have a relative mass per mass. This may sound confusing at the moment, but I'm sure with examples and also with the discussions and the extra details that you have on the lecture notes, this will become more clear. An important thing to point out though, is that whenever we're evaluating this, and this will just rely on obtaining simple integrals from a lower mass to a high mass. And this is just a power law. It's very easy to integrate due to the physical constraints that we just talked in the previous subsection, we will typically be applying cutoffs. If we want to look at all stars formed from 0.1 to 100 solar masses, but if we're focusing on a specific mass range, then we actually want to integrate just over that mass range. You can find all the details in the lecture notes, but I think it is useful to try to guide you through how you would actually use the initial mass function to say, actually calculate the total number of stars that have been formed. Typically what we're going to use is this simple power law. And I told you that in 263, we typically will only be using a single power law. This power law is essentially telling you about the relative number of stars per unit mass. One of the things that we can very easily show, and this will essentially just come out of integrating the initial mass function, is that the total number of stars will be given by the constant divided by alpha plus one. This is just to do with how we're going to integrate it. And then the difference between the maximum mass and the minimum mass with an exponent of alpha plus one. This can be very easily done. Essentially, all you have to do if you want to calculate the total number of stars is you integrate from a minimum mass to maximum mass, the integral of the function a times m to the power of alpha. And therefore, when you integrate, and this is a very simple integral in 112, this is probably something you'd be doing on the first day, you end up with this, and you can write it then as a being this constant of the initial mass function divided by the exponent plus one, and that the difference between m max alpha plus one and m min alpha plus one. As an example of an application, and remember that you do not need to memorize that expression directly. You can just start from the power law and integrate, and that would be my recommendation of how you do it. But let's say that we want to apply where we just derived that expression for the total number of stars formed. Let's say that we were looking at a cloud of gas with 10 to the six solar masses that essentially was transformed, 30% of it got transformed into stars. Therefore, the total stellar mass is three times 10 to the five solar masses. And the question we could actually address is how many stars were actually formed when this process happened? What you typically need to do is to assume some alpha or the exponent of the power law in this case, we're going to use minus 2.35. This is usually referred to as Salpeter IMF because of the author that actually established this, mostly for our own galaxy. And we need to set some limits into what we're going to integrate. In this case, we want the total number of stars, and therefore we'll go from the minimum stellar mass of a star to the typical maximum, so 0 0.1 to 100. If we want to find the total number of stars, we do need to find what A is, what we can do, and I would encourage you to have a look at application two in the lecture notes where this has essentially been derived. It's the same process as we did before for N, but in this case, it would be for the total stellar mass. And it's a very similar expression, except we actually have alpha plus two and not alpha plus one as for the number of stars. The reason why we can use this is because in this problem, we actually know what is the total mass formed. The total mass formed has to do with the total mass that was in the cloud times the efficiency, or what is the percentage of that mass that actually turned into stars. And we know that this is given by this expression because we know the total mass, we can actually derive the value of A, this constant. And this is really helpful because we can then actually use the expression we derived before 
remember that the number of stars, this is just to do with the, the integral and we are integrating from 0.1 solar masses to 100. If we plug in the values, we realize that this cloud, when it transformed into stars with a 30% efficiency, it formed 8.54 times 10 to the five stars. Let's try to visualize what the IMF is really telling you. And in this plot, you can see it very clearly. I've tried to plot dn dm, this is in the log scale, versus the mass in solar masses, and also note the log scale on the x-axis. If we plot the expression with a times m to the power of alpha, and in this case, I'm actually using alpha to be minus 2.35, and we even calculated what a, the constant was, so we can really plot this. So we see that at the moment of formation, this is how the relative number of stars per mass look like. We also know how to associate mass with spectral class. So this is really telling us that there will be a lot of M class stars. There will be less K, less G, and only a few O type stars. An important thing to realize is that the IMF for the initial mass function is describing the relative number of stars per mass or the mass per mass distribution at a birth moment. This is what happens at instant zero when all stars have been formed essentially. However, as time starts ticking, the main sequence lifetimes start to elapse. And we've seen that the main sequence lifetimes can be very easily calculated by just looking at the mass and solar masses. Now, because the most massive stars always dominate the light because of the temperature dependence, and remember that luminosity goes as m to the power of four, and also as t to the power of four, while these spectral types are alive, they're going to dominate the light, even though they're way, way less luminous than all the others, but their lifetimes are going to be very short, orders of few million years maximum. Therefore, after a few million years, some of these stars will start disappearing, and what will happen is that the initial mass function will become the mass function, or the mass function that you observe after an amount of time, and it will start to have some truncation. And this truncation can actually be very easily calculated by this expression in terms of time. So when you set time equals to this expression for a specific mass, at that specific moment in time, all the more massive spectral types will be gone. They will have evolved away from the main sequence. Many of them, they have gone supernova. We can actually plug in the values and we can even see that the IMF will be truncated essentially two to four million years after all stars have been formed. These spectral types are very short-lived. And once time passes, after about one giga year, all B class stars will also be gone. And therefore the spectrum of a star cluster, for example, will be dominated by A class stars. And if you're looking at a cluster that's even older and that didn't form any more stars since this initial moment, after 3.6 giga years, it will be dominated by F-class stars. And if you're looking at some of the oldest clusters in the universe, stars like the sun will be those that dominate it. 